The reason that these higher beings would hold a simulation is to see what happens. They don't know what happens. Do you believe in God? The famous businessman, Elon Musk, has recently issued a statement that might completely change how we think about the future. Musk firmly believes that the long-discussed idea of the rapture is on the horizon, and his declaration is closely tied to certain Christian beliefs. But what evidence or reasoning has led him to this conclusion, and how will it affect our society? Join us as we take a trip into Elon's mind and controversial statement about the rapture, exploring the rapture in Christian beliefs. The idea of the rapture, as imagined by certain religious groups, presents a captivating scene of a grand gathering between departed Christian souls and those still living, drawing inspiration from ancient scriptures. This concept, rooted in the Greek term harpazo, meaning to snatch away or seize, as found in the Bible's first epistle to the Thessalonians, embodies the expectation of a supernatural reunion that opposes earthly limitations. In theological discussions, the idea of the rapture stands out as a relatively modern addition to Christian beliefs, originating from emotional debates in the 1930s. Unlike traditional Christian teachings, it gained importance primarily within fundamentalist circles in the United States. The attraction of the rapture lies in its mystical appeal, captivating the imagination with its celestial promise. Beyond being seen as a very cosmic event, the rapture holds deeper significance as a potential pathway to divine unity or a gateway to the permanent bliss of heaven. It offers believers a glimpse into the possibility of exceeding earthly boundaries and experiencing the splendors of the afterlife. The interesting concept of the rapture, a theological wonder, arouses lively discussions about when it will occur and the close return of Christ. Among these discussions, the pre-tribulation view stands out greatly. This belief carefully separates the rapture from Christ's second coming, considering a seven-year tribulation period before Christ's victorious return and the beginning of a blissful thousand-year reign known as the Messianic Kingdom. This theory finds its roots in the detailed biblical analysis conducted by John Nelson Darby in 1833. However, the landscape of beliefs regarding the rapture is diverse and dynamic. Spirited debates remain within evangelical circles, with some advocating for the established pre-tribulation posture, while others embrace an alternative viewpoint known as the post-tribulation rapture. According to this perspective, the sequence of events in the grand prophetic narrative unfolds differently. The ongoing fervor within evangelical discussions underscores the captivating nature of this subject. Notably, not all Christian groups adhere to the idea of the rapture. Some interpret the biblical gathering mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4 clearly, eschewing the term rapture altogether. Instead, they predict a celestial assembly with Christ immediately after his second coming, rejecting the idea of a crucial portion of humanity enduring an extended tribulation period. The richness of these discussions highlights the complexity and depth of belief systems within Christian theology. Elon Musk's Controversial Views on Jesus and Spirituality In a recent casual chat with the Babylon Bee, the mysterious Elon Musk delved into the interesting concept of the upcoming rapture. But what truly captivated the audience was his wonderful opinion of Jesus Christ and his religious beliefs. Musk, the visionary mind behind Tesla, didn't just dismiss the question of whether he accepts Jesus as his spiritual guide. Instead, he delved into a serious discussion, drawing parallels between his own beliefs and the timeless wisdom briefed by Jesus. With thoughtful behavior, Musk highlighted the serious teachings of Jesus promoting the importance of concepts like turning the other cheek, forgiveness, and the golden rule of treating others with the same respect we desire for ourselves. He particularly resonated with the timeless advice of love thy neighbor as thyself, seeing it as a fundamental principle for a harmonious society. What's truly interesting is Musk's optimistic outlook on the idea of Jesus potentially saving people. His response exudes a refreshing sense of openness and curiosity as he nonchalantly remarks, Sure, I'll be saved. Why not? Despite his baptism as a child, Musk openly admits to grappling with profound existential questions about the existence of God, faith, and the narratives surrounding Jesus in the Bible. While he may not consider himself deeply religious, Musk's contemplative nature 
has led him to embrace prayer, hoping for the opportunity to engage in meaningful discussions on these profound topics. For Musk, these conversations hold immense significance, not just on a personal level, but for humanity as a whole. In a world often overshadowed by adversity, Musk sees the potential for such dialogues to serve as beacons of hope, spreading joy, and fostering understanding among people from all walks of life. As he envisions a future where good news is not just a rarity, but a universal norm, Musk's optimism shines through. He believes that embracing discussions on spirituality and morality can be viewed as a collective achievement for humanity, transcending geographical boundaries and cultural differences. Opposing Beliefs About the Rapture the idea of the rapture is a subject that ignites many different thoughts and beliefs among Christians. At the heart of this conversation lies the question of where those who experience the rapture go immediately. Some, known as dispensationalists, firmly believe that this event transports Christians straight to heaven's gates, welcoming them into the divine presence. Catholic scholars, such as Walter Drum in 1912, agree with this view. They also see the event described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 1 to 17 as a journey to heaven, considering a celestial reunion and a connection with the divine in the beauty of the heavens. However, within the Anglican tradition, there exists a variety of perspectives. Notably, theologians like N.T. Wright offer a unique interpretation. They propose that the destination of this gathering might be a specific earthly location. This idea echoes concerns within the Christian environmentalist community, suggesting a focus on the earthly realm, possibly related to stewardship and care for the planet. Turning to the question of when the rapture is set to happen on the eschatological timeline, there are exciting viewpoints. Some argue that it could be hinted at in Matthew chapter 24 verse 37 to 40. They highlight the striking similarities between the texts, suggesting that the rapture might align with the perusia, or the second coming of the Lord. This view imagines a grand and synchronized event of great importance. It's like a majestic gathering where the faithful are lifted to meet their Lord. On the other hand, some people argue that neither the church nor the idea of being lifted is mentioned in the Bible verse, Matthew 24. They carefully analyze the subtle differences between Matthew chapter 24 verse 37 to 40 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13 to 18. As a result, these two passages become central points of discussion and deep thought when it comes to understanding when the rapture might occur. By examining these passages closely, scholars uncover crucial distinctions, leaving room for various interpretations. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 to 17, the American Standard Version vividly describes the event. It talks about those eagerly awaiting the Lord's arrival and those who have passed away rising to meet him. It paints a vivid picture of the Lord descending from heaven amid celestial announcements, the commanding voice of an archangel, and the resounding call of God's trumpet. Those who have passed away in Christ are the first to rise, followed by those who are still alive. Together, they ascend into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, where they will remain forever in his divine presence. In contrast, Matthew chapter 24 verse 37 to 40 compares the event to the days of Noah. It portrays a world preoccupied with ordinary activities like eating, drinking, marrying, and going about their daily routines. Then, suddenly, something unexpected happens. Some are taken, and others are left behind. This presents a wide range of beliefs about the end times and the timing of the rapture. When it comes to understanding when the rapture might occur, there is a spectrum of beliefs within the study of end times, ranging from amillennialism to postmillennialism. Different viewpoints on the timing of the rapture exist, with some asserting that it coincides with Jesus' return, as described in various passages of the Bible. This idea suggests that after the rapture, there will be a period symbolically referred to as the millennium, during which the world undergoes a spiritual transformation. In one perspective called premillennialism, believers anticipate the rapture to happen before a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth. This concept is distinctive within Christian beliefs about the end times. Within premillennialism, there's a pre-tribulation stance that separates the rapture and Jesus' second coming into two distinct events. According to this view, the rapture precedes a period of intense tribulation lasting seven years. This tribulation ends in the return of Christ, followed by a thousand-year reign known as the Messianic Kingdom. The roots of this theory trace back to the interpretations of the Bible, 
particularly the work of John Nelson Darby in 1833. Although pre-tribulationism is the predominant belief among rapture believers today, it faces challenges within evangelical communities. Some proponents argue for a post-tribulation rapture, suggesting a different sequence of events leading up to Jesus' return. This diversity of views adds depth to discussions about the end times among Christians. The Evolution of End Times Beliefs In the early days of the church, there was a widespread belief known as Chiliasm. This belief, based on the teachings of Eusebius, suggested that many centuries would pass after the resurrection of the dead before the physical appearance of Christ's kingdom on earth. Eusebius believed that Christ's kingdom would manifest physically on earth, and this idea influenced other early church leaders like Irenaeus. They used Eusebius's teachings to bolster their views, citing the ancient origins of these ideas. This perspective finds support from Schaff, who affirmed that Chiliasm, also called millenarianism, was a significant aspect of early church beliefs regarding the end times. Chiliasm proposed that Christ would visibly reign on earth alongside resurrected saints for a thousand years before the final judgment. However, as time went on, theological differences emerged, leading to the development of two distinct schools of thought, the Antioch and Alexandrian schools. The Alexandrian school can be traced back to the influence of Philo, a Hellenized Jewish scholar who sought to reconcile divine truths with what he perceived as inconsistencies in the Tanakh. The theologians from this tradition believed that the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ, was symbolic. They interpreted it as representing Christ's rule from the heavenly realm rather than a literal earthly kingdom. The allegorical interpretation of religious texts which sees them as symbolic rather than literal, was dominant for over a thousand years. Scholars like Origen and Augustine, who were followers of the Alexandrian school, heavily influenced this perspective. In contrast, the Antiochian school advocated for a more literal approach to interpreting religious texts, believing in taking the words at face value without reading too much symbolism into them. However, they didn't actively challenge the symbolic interpretations proposed by the Alexandrians. In the 12th century, there was a surge of anxiety for the future, guided by the thoughts of Yakima Fior, a forward-looking thinker. He embarked on an interesting journey through the Book of Revelation, painting a vivid picture of the coming days, foreseeing a rejuvenation of the earth, the inclusion of Jewish people into a new faith, and a remarkable era known as the millennium descending upon our world. His teachings had a wide-reaching influence, captivating hearts and minds across Europe. Within the Catholic Church, however, a future-focused reading of biblical prophecies wasn't the norm until 1590, when a Jesuit named Francisco Ribera introduced visionary insights that challenged the traditional interpretation. In the past, there was an interesting concept called the gathering of the elect, which is similar to what we now call the rapture. This idea was first introduced by Vera's theory, which vividly described this event happening just 45 days before the end of a period of turmoil. Jumping ahead to the 17th century, Across the ocean in America, the Puritans and Cotton Mather ignited what is now known as the Rapture Doctrine. Their belief was captivating, imagining a scenario where faithful believers would be taken from earth into the skies, followed by divine judgments on our planet, leading to a golden age called the Millennium. These ideas gained traction with various thinkers like Robert Mayon, Nathaniel Holmes, John Brown, Thomas Vincent, Henry Danvers, and William Sherwin. While they didn't use the term rapture, the concept itself was becoming more defined. The 17th to 19th centuries were a time of significant development for the concept of the rapture. However, it wasn't until the early 19th century when Edward Irving emerged that the idea truly began to flourish. Born in 1792, Irving was a visionary scholar who deeply explored prophecy in 1825. His contributions helped establish and popularize the idea of the rapture. He stumbled upon a profound idea, a two-part return of Christ. In the first phase, he prophesied a secretive rapture event preceding the rise of the Antichrist, a figure often linked with apocalyptic scenarios. Edward Miller, a modern of Irving, further refined this visionary concept. He described it as a triplet of gatherings. First, a gathering of the chosen ones, represented by the wise virgins who follow the Lamb. Second, a gathering of a plentiful harvest by God. And finally, an assembly of the wicked facing their rightful punishment. 
Over time, this idea of the rapture evolved and deepened through the contributions of various thinkers, from Joachim of Fior to the Mathers, and ultimately to Edward Irving and Edward Miller. Each added their unique perspective, enriching the concept with layers of complexity and depth. The rapture, as it is understood today, is the completion of centuries of theological attention, understanding, and visionary insight. It weaves together history, religion, and a hint of the supernatural to form a compelling narrative of hope and greatness, promising a future event that will uplift the faithful and improve the way for a dramatic transformation of the world. The Pre-Tribulation Rapture Belief The concept of the pre-tribulation rapture is a crucial belief among Christians regarding future events. It suggests that before a period of intense hardship known as the tribulation, Jesus will gather all of his followers. This tribulation is predicted to last for seven years, after which Jesus will return. This idea gained prominence in the 19th century, largely due to the teachings of John Nelson Darby. The Plymouth Brethren in England were particularly drawn to this concept, and it gained traction in America as well. Darby's teachings, along with writings from other leaders of the Brethren movement, helped disseminate this belief. Discussions about these ideas were frequent in gatherings like Bible conferences, starting in 1878. Special events such as the Niagara Bible Conference played a pivotal role in popularizing these concepts about the future. These concepts revolved around pre-millennialism, the belief in Jesus' return before a thousand years of peace, and the pre-tribulation rapture, which suggests that righteous individuals will be taken up to be with Jesus before the tribulation. Many individuals, particularly those affiliated with Presbyterian, Baptist, or congregational churches, were attracted to these ideas. The dissemination of these beliefs was further facilitated by books and Bibles, such as William E. Blackstone's Jesus' Coming, which saw widespread distribution after its publication in 1878. In the early 20th century, the Schofield Reference Bible emerged, offering profound insights into the concept of the pre-tribulation rapture, which captivated many minds. Delving deeper into history, traces of this notion appear to stretch back centuries perhaps even to a 7th century manuscript known as the Apocalypse of Pseudo-Ephraim the Syrian. Within this ancient text lies a fascinating passage envisioning a gathering of virtuous souls chosen by God before a tumultuous period known as the Tribulation. According to this narrative, these chosen individuals are to be whisked away to the presence of God, spared from witnessing the chaos and suffering that will ensue due to human misdeeds. While some learned individuals, termed scholars, debate the authenticity and interpretation of this segment within the ancient text, its inclusion adds an exhilarating dimension to the speculative discourse surrounding events preceding the tribulation. Moreover, echoes of similar themes resonate in writings from the 18th and 19th centuries, such as an essay penned by Morgan Edwards in 1788 in Philadelphia. These works further contribute to the rich variety of ideas surrounding the notion of a pre-tribulation rapture, infusing the discussion with historical depth and interest. In the year 1812, there lived a Catholic priest named Manuel Lacunza, who penned a fascinating manuscript concerning the ultimate fate of the world. Interestingly, Lacunza chose to cloak his identity under the pseudonym Juan Fat Ben Ezra for this literary endeavor. The resulting work, titled La Venida del Messias and Gloria Ima Estad, delved into the potential occurrences leading up to the second coming of Jesus. Despite Lacunza's passing in 1827, his book retained its significance over the years. Edward Irving, a Scottish minister, took up the task of translating it into English, thereby widening its reach and impact. This translation played a pivotal role in disseminating the notion that virtuous individuals might be removed from the world before tumultuous times ensue, known as the pre-tribulation perspective. Fast forward to the 1970s, where the concepts introduced in Lacunza's work gained further traction thanks to popular books like The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey and films such as A Thief in the Night. These mediums helped to amplify and popularize the ideas proposed by Lacunza, captivating audiences with their depiction of impending events and stirring discussions about the end times. Now just very quick, if it's your first time here on my channel, 
I would appreciate if you would like the video so that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. Subscribe and also click that notification bell so you won't miss any of the next videos that are uploaded every day. All right, let's keep rolling. In 1995, a set of books titled Left Behind by Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins gained widespread popularity, selling millions of copies worldwide. These books marked a significant moment in the history of the pre-tribulation rapture belief, which holds that believers will be taken up to heaven before a period of tribulation on earth. Some scholars, such as Thomas Ice, suggest that similar ideas can be traced back to early Christian writings, indicating long-standing interest in this concept. More recently, Elon Musk sparked astonishment across the globe by suggesting that the rapture might occur soon. His unexpected remarks left many people feeling bewildered and intrigued, prompting contemplation about the implications and uncertainties surrounding such an event. Musk's cryptic statements challenge us to reevaluate our beliefs and confront the unknown. In essence, it's like a complex puzzle that we are collectively striving to unravel, pondering what lies ahead and how it may shape our lives. A unique perspective on the rapture. Some people have a different idea about when they believe the rapture, a moment when faithful believers are said to be taken up to be with Jesus, might occur. They propose that this event will happen not at the beginning or the end of a challenging period known as the tribulation, but right in the middle of it. This perspective is commonly referred to as the mid-tribulation viewpoint. According to this belief, believers will initially experience difficulties during the tribulation. However, just before the situation worsens significantly, during an intense period known as the Great Tribulation, characterized by God's heightened anger, believers will be taken up to be with Jesus. Supporters of the mid-tribulation perspective often cite a passage from the book of Daniel, specifically, chapter 7. This chapter contains a prophecy that predicts a specific period of hardship for God's followers. It mentions a duration of time, times, and half a time, which is interpreted as 3.5 years or three and a half years. These believers hold that right in the middle of this period. A significant event known as the abomination of desolation will occur. During this event, they believe that the Antichrist, a figure representing ultimate evil, will commit a profoundly disrespectful act within a sacred place known as the Temple in Jerusalem. This unique perspective offers a fascinating lens through which to contemplate the timing of the rapture, particularly when examining the intricate prophecies outlined in the book of Daniel. While it may not boast widespread acceptance, the intricacies of how these prophetic events might interconnect during the tumultuous period known as eschatology, the study of end times according to religious beliefs, are undeniably captivating. Imagine delving into the concept of the pre-wrath rapture as if unraveling a mystery novel, a scenario where righteous souls are caught up to meet Jesus amidst the chaos of the tribulation, just before his triumphant return. This viewpoint isn't merely a theological concept, but a narrative rich in symbolism and anticipation, drawing parallels to ancient texts and modern interpretations alike. Central to this fascinating perspective is the notion of Daniel's 70th week, which serves as a dramatic countdown to the climax of human history. Within this prophetic timeline, believers endure trials and tribulations, similar to the rising action of an epic saga. The imagery evoked is vivid, a world plunged into turmoil, with the forces of good and evil locked in a cosmic struggle. As the narrative unfolds, the Great Tribulation emerges as a pivotal chapter, characterized by the emergence of a sinister figure known as the Antichrist. This embodiment of malevolence looms large, casting a shadow over the fate of humanity and heightening the tension of the unfolding drama. But amidst the darkness, there is a glimmer of hope, the promise of the rapture. According to this perspective, it serves as a beacon of light amid despair, offering solace to believers enduring the trials of the end times. It's a moment of divine intervention, a turning point in the narrative that heralds the beginning of the end. And yet, the story doesn't end there. Following the rapture, the stage is set for a cataclysmic showdown as God's justice is unleashed upon the world. The imagery is apocalyptic, seals are broken, trumpets sound, and bowls are poured out, signaling the climax of the cosmic conflict and the dawn of a new era. In essence, this perspective on the pre-wrath rapture isn't just a theological concept. 
It's a gripping tale of redemption, resilience, and divine intervention, woven through with symbolism and suspense. It invites us to ponder the mysteries of the universe and contemplate our place within the grand hanging of existence. The meaning of life is, is that much greater. And so I would call, like I said, like I, the philosophy of curiosity. The theory called partial conditional or selective rapture suggests that only devout Christians will be taken up in the rapture before a time of great trouble known as the Great Tribulation. This idea says that being close to God personally matters more than just saying you believe in Him. So according to some people who support this theory, when you become a believer in the Great Tribulation, decide whether they'll be taken up in the rapture. Others who believe in this theory say only those who have strong, unwavering faith and a real connection with God will be taken up, while others will face the challenges of the Great Tribulation. According to this theory, those who aren't taken up in the rapture will face difficult times during the Great Tribulation, as described in the Book of Revelation. Some people who believe in this theory think these believers who weren't taken up will experience these hardships between the fifth and sixth seals mentioned in Revelation. It's a sad idea because it means they'll face tough times and maybe even die during this period. However, others think differently. They believe that believers who aren't taken up in the rapture before the Great Tribulation will still get their chance during or after it. According to Ira David, who supports this viewpoint, believers will be taken up in groups during the Tribulation when they're ready. This idea is part of a theological perspective called post-tribulation premillennialism. The idea of the rapture closely relates to Jesus' second coming or meeting with him in the sky just before he returns to earth, ushering in a literal thousand-year period known as the millennium. In this perspective, the rapture marks the end of a challenging time called the tribulation. Some scholars see this tribulation as encompassing our entire current era, while others view it as a specific period leading up to Christ's return. The key belief here is that the church will endure this tribulation. One important passage supporting this idea is found in Matthew chapter 24 verse 29 to 31, which mentions the gathering of believers after the tribulation. In the post-tribulation view, the rapture is seen as happening simultaneously with Jesus' return. According to this belief, when Jesus comes back, believers will be taken up to meet him in the sky and then accompany him on his journey back to earth. Paul's letters, such as 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 to 17 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 51 to 52, describe a trumpet sounding after the tribulation as a sign of Christ's return. This view finds additional support in Revelation 11:15. Looking at the book of Revelation, chapter 6 to 9 and later chapter 20 verse 1 to 3 describe a time when Satan is bound and believers reign with Christ for a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20 verse 4 to 6 speaks of the first resurrection which is seen as a blessed event for those who participate. This elaborate vision of the rapture and its surrounding events adds layers of intrigue and anticipation to the Christian belief in Jesus' return and the ultimate triumph of good over evil. The binding of Satan is described in Revelation 20 verse 4 to 6, which talks about a period of a thousand years when Christ reigns alongside believers. During this time, those who have died and are faithful to Christ come back to life and share in his rule. However, those who are not part of this resurrection do not come back to life until the thousand years are over. This period is known as the first resurrection, and those who take part in it are considered blessed and holy. Millennialists believe that Christ's reign began when the church was established and will continue until he returns. They see the church as the starting point of Christ's kingdom with events like Pentecost being significant examples. They believe that Christ is ruling alongside believers through sacred rituals and ceremonies, and they eagerly await the fulfillment of his reign when he returns. On the other hand, amillennialists interpret the thousand years in Revelation symbolically, seeing it as representing the ongoing era of the church. 
They anticipate a transformative event similar to the rapture when Christ returns, which they connect to the significance of Pentecost. Unlike premillennialists, they focus on Christ's reign throughout the different phases of the New Covenant, past, present, and future. They interpret mentions of Jerusalem in Revelation as symbolic of a new Jerusalem or a new heaven and earth. Some people, known as millennialists, don't support rebuilding the Jerusalem temple. They believe that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross replaced the need for animal sacrifices. This idea has been backed by historical figures like St. Augustine and is currently accepted by many Christian groups such as Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Anglicans, Lutherans, Methodists, Presbyterians, and Reformed congregations. They emphasize that Jesus continues to rule and the church plays a spiritual role in preparing for the future. This perspective contrasts sharply with the belief in an imminent rapture. Instead of focusing on a sudden event, millennialists think about Christ's ongoing rule and the church's spiritual duties. They stress the importance of continuous preparation for a future where divine promises will be fulfilled. This wraps up our look into the millennialist viewpoint on biblical prophecy. What are your thoughts on Elon Musk's warning about rapture? Share your opinions in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.